Does the news of climate change and environmental disasters leave you feeling helpless or anxious? Or maybe you feel your awareness has risen and motivation to act has emerged. Let's check it out. I'm Anastasia, a psychologist and master coach. Welcome to the exploration of climate anxiety and its impacts. In the previous video, I began to talk about our emotional responses to this global challenge. If you are curious about the broader scope of emotions related to the climate crisis, I recommend revisiting that video. Today, our focus shifts to a more specific aspect – eco-anxiety. We'll examine its authenticity, explore the stages of developing feelings about the climate crisis, and in the second part of the video, I'll tell more about grief and provide practical recommendations for building resilience in the face of such overwhelming environmental concerns. But first, let's do a test to explore our emotional responses to climate change. To help yourself with naming your feelings, you can download a list of possible feelings you may experience regarding climate change. This is a climate emotions wheel created based on research. We are going to watch a short segment from the documentary Before the Flood. As you watch, I want you to be mindful of your feelings. Pay attention to what emotions surface and where in your body you feel them. Are you ready? So, let's begin. The oceans are like this big buffer because they absorb carbon dioxide. They take up about a third of the CO2 that we're dumping into the atmosphere. So because of that, they are a stabilizing force in climate. The problem is the ocean can't do its job fast enough with this absurd rate of carbon dioxide emissions. You know, life isn't going to disappear in the ocean. There will always be life in the ocean but it's not going to be necessarily the kind of life we want. We could go back to three billion years ago and have just a whole lot of slime. We're taking away the ecosystems that normally help us to restabilize the climate. Like oceans, rainforests absorb carbon from our atmosphere decades and decades of the forest breathing in the carbon, storing it in the trunks and the leaves and the organic matter. So those carbon emissions are being held safe for us until we clear them and light them on fire. It acts like a carbon bomb and releases massive carbon emissions back into the atmosphere. Now, please pause the video. Take a moment to reflect on your feelings. What emotions did you experience? Write them down or consider where they might fall on a wheel of emotions. Welcome back. Let's talk about what you might have felt. It's normal to experience a range of emotions during such a powerful documentary. Some of you might have felt frightened, angry, or even been in denial or irritated. And that's okay. Look at your emotions in the context of this wheel. Are they more positive or negative? If your emotions were intense, particularly in the negative quadrants, this might indicate climate anxiety. What we all have in common is that we all have different feelings. Climate anxiety or eco-anxiety is a term that includes the feelings of fear, distress and helplessness caused by observing the ongoing effects of climate change and worrying about the future of our planet. As you may have noticed, these feelings are strong. Some environmentalists and policymakers emphasize the importance of not inducing anxiety when discussing climate change, but the reality of global warming is anxiety-provoking. Acknowledging and enduring this anxiety is crucial for facing the reality of our situation. We know that when anxiety becomes too overwhelming, our thinking can skew towards irrationality, losing proportion and clarity. My video aims to provide practical recommendations for managing climate anxiety. By understanding and addressing climate anxiety, we can maintain a balanced and rational perspective, 
essential to both personal well-being and effective environmental advocacy. Join me as we navigate this topic, understanding that while the journey may be challenging, it's also filled with opportunities for growth, learning and impactful action. So, let's begin. Initially, comparing climate anxiety to personal grief, like the loss of a loved one, was met with skepticism. But by now, it became clear that the grief caused by the climate crisis often surpasses traditional grief in its intensity and complexity. Individuals facing this grief feel shattered and disoriented, as if the systems ensuring life stability are collapsing, especially when we speak about people who are facing this information first. Psychologists outline this process in stages, which can be visualized through a diagram. Initially, a person may live in a state of unawareness regarding climate change. This could be due to a lack of information or conscious or subconscious denial of the facts. And the transition from the state of acknowledging the reality of climate change can be marked by a sense of betrayal and shock. I indicated three aspects on the diagram – actions, feelings and self-defense mechanisms. At the action level, the individual often seeks more information and takes action. He might attempt to engage in numerous activities simultaneously. This proactive approach, however, can lead to an understanding of the limited impact of individual actions and fuel further anxiety, risk and burnout. The individual might discuss these concerns with others only to find that his feelings of urgency and grief are not always shared or understood. This stage is usually characterized by a high-tended sense of urgency. At this stage, people talk of being unable to sleep, being unable to stop thinking about it, losing their appetite, and continuously living in a high state of alertness. Subconscious denial mechanisms may continue to manifest to protect the psyche. It's important to recognize that these are normal responses to receiving very bad news. You could hear that action is the antidote to despair. And there is some truth to that, but this misses the cost of participation. Action that occurs in the turmoil of feelings is often undirected and exhausting. Difficult feelings need to be recognized, understood, supported and worked with. For example, this is what my regular group meetings are devoted to. At the first stage, Everything that gives a sense of security and the likelihood of life continuing seems to disappear. People cannot imagine any future or anything that could give life meaning. These experiences are difficult to articulate and difficult to respond to. Young people often feel as if they have been betrayed by the government and their parents, the ones who in their mind were supposed to take care of them and provide security. Older people who have seen what the world used to be like and how it has changed can be overwhelmed with grief for what has been lost. Some people may find themselves isolated from family and friends if they do not share their concerns. Anyway, at any age, coming out of state of denial is extremely painful. Of course, not everyone experiences such intense and traumatic grief, but it's present in some form for most people facing the climate crisis. It needs to be talked about, supported, understood and experienced. By working with your feelings, you can come to a place where they are no longer unmanageable, where life makes sense and actions become sustainable. But this is the next stage. By understanding these emotional responses, you equip yourself with the tools to manage your feelings effectively. In a world where the climate crisis impacts all aspects of life, being able to navigate your emotional landscape is more than self-care. It's also a way to extend in care to others and contributing positively to the collective effort against climate change. In the upcoming next part of this video, I'll tell you about the second stage of accepting information about the climate crisis. Also, I'll be sharing some practical strategies on how to effectively manage climate anxiety and not to pass on your anxiety to other people. Meanwhile, I encourage you to revisit my previous video, Dare to Feel, where we initially explored the climate crisis 
and our emotional reactions to it. There you'll find some preliminary recommendations that might be helpful. Now take a moment to review what you heard today and watch the recommendations from the previous video. Consider which strategies you will read it right and think about how they felt for you. Were there any that resonated particularly well with you? Or perhaps some that you wouldn't want to try? This self-reflection will be a valuable preparation for our next discussion. I look forward to reconnecting with you next week. Until then, take care of yourself and stay engaged in this important conversation. Remember, understanding and managing our emotional responses to the climate crisis is not just crucial for our personal well-being, but also for our collective ability to address this global challenge effectively. See you soon! Thank mm-hmm. you.